1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 9. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel, come on, that's a good name. You need to name your cat that. That's what every cat should be named. Jezebel. Everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent them this message. Somebody say message. message. It, it was a message. It, it wasn't something in, in it, it was just a message. It was a text message. Come on, it was an email. Sent just a message to Elijah. And this is what the message said. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you, just as you have killed them. Elijah was afraid. And he fled for his life. This dude was scared and he ran. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down, slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel came down, touched him, and said, Yo, wake up. Get up and eat. Verse 6. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Come on, somebody say free lunch. So he ate and drank, and he laid down again. But verse 7 says this. Then the angel of the Lord came down, and he touched him again and said, Hey, you need to get up. Eat some more, for the journey ahead of you will be too much. So he got up, ate, and drank in the food that gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Then he came to a cave. Somebody say cave. Keep, be, be, be following me, watching, where he spent the night in this cave. And the Lord said to Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? The title of this message is this, what do I need in hard times? What do I need in hard times. Will you pray with me? Lord, there's some people in here whose hearts are broken. There's some people in here that we just say, God, we really need you. And Lord, I thank you through your word today. You're going to teach us what to do when times are rough. Teach us what to do when we feel like we're in a cave. Teach us what to do when we feel like we're all alone. Lord, we rely on you. We open up our hearts. Holy Spirit, have your way. We lean on you and need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I've always been quite fashionable. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, look at these, these shoes. Uh, my socks are a little funny, but uh, I like fashion, man. Back in the day, I don't know if anyone in here would know what this is. I've, like, I've always liked fashion. I, uh, maybe, I don't even know, Frank, I think Adrian would know. Uh, I used to wear Jinkos. So these are these big old jag baggy jeans, like I'm talking like with this chain. I I've always liked fashion. Abercrombie and Fitch, come on, they had the best cologne in the game back in the day. Maybe still do. Uh, it's actually cheaper. I like Versace, if you uh, were wondering, uh, but... Just, I like the name of it, Versace. It just sounds good to say, you know. But I, I, I like fashion, man. I always have. I went to Hollister at one point. Uh, I used to go to Pac Sun, and now I go to Zara. Come on, give me a gift card for some, somebody. Uh, I've always loved fashion, but you know what's hilarious? When I first got saved, which is almost 10 years ago, the thing that was in were these jeans called True Religion. Anyone know what True Religion jeans are? Now, True religion was awesome, and one of my good friends, Victor, who's uh, Frank, the guy who was doing exhortation uh, and did transitions and announcement, his brother worked at True Religion. Now, uh, I first got saved. I needed a little part-time job. So during Black Friday, he was like, yo, I can get you a job at True Religion Jeans. So then, you know what? You get like half off of the jeans. So I was like, all right, I would easily be able to do that. I worked for a week. I used, I'm talking like I used used, used, used my discount. I got 50% off so many pairs of jeans. But listen, I got the dopest, nicest pair of all white jeans you would ever imagine. Come on. I was walking around like an angel, yo. Like I was just like floating. I just felt cool. Wearing my Toms. Anyone remember Toms? Have my Toms on. Come on. My white religions. I, and Here's the deal. Toms, they tell you that if you buy one, they give one to, like, some kid in some, some country. I don't know if this is real, but they, 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 they drug me in. I was like, yo, this feels good giving my money to something like this. So I did it, hoping, you know, if they didn't, God's going to judge them for lying to us. But I, I want to believe Tom knew what he was doing. So Toms had my white religion jeans, and I felt really cool because I liked fashion. And one day I was working, and uh, I decided, yo, it's in the morning. Me and my cousin Jason, I'm like, you know what we need to do? We need to go hit up. Chick-fil-A because how many people know Chick-fil-A has the greatest breakfast burritos in the nation. Oh, they are so good. But I want to teach you something. You cannot go to Chick-fil-A and get breakfast burritos if you do not have the salsa because that salsa is just the most incredible thing in the world. But there's one issue with that salsa. 
it's bright red. I'm talking like blood of Jesus red. I'm talking like red, 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 redder than a rose red. You know what I'm saying? And so for me, I go through and we're, I don't have a car at this point due to some choices that I had made, so my cousin had to drive me. He drove me through the line at Chick-fil-A. We wait in this long old line that's like in the mornings. It's like all the way and the people are out there with their little uh, iPad and they're like, hey, what would you like? I was like, that is the dumbest question I've ever heard. I'm sorry to say, I want a burrito. You know this. Come on, give me my breakfast burrito. I wait in line, I get my breakfast burrito and I am like starving, yo. I'm so hungry and I felt fresh because I'm in my white pants. I get this thing of salsa, and I say, oh, I want to go ahead and take a bite, but I'm like, nah, I got to wait for the salsa. I try to open this salsa, and I'm not telling you, it was a salsa. I know Chick-fil-A is godly, and they're, they love Jesus and everything, but this salsa was from the pit of hell, and it would not, it would not open. I'm for real. It would not open, and like, I'm, come on, look at me. I'm strong, like, uh, I'm like strong, strong, so I'm like, what is happening right now? So I decide to go Super Saiyan on this, this salsa pack, and I open it. I use a little bit more force, yo, and I'm not playing. I literally, <laughs> I tore the whole entire thing in half. And all of a sudden, in slow motion, I see that red, blood of Jesus looking salsa fly out. And guess where it lands? Right on my white pants, yo. In my brand new, true religion pants that day got ruined. Now, I I'm just gonna tell you, in that moment, I'm not exaggerating, my whole entire day was ruined from one little thing. Have you ever like noticed how it's like the small things in life have this way of just like ruining our day? For some of us putting in our world, it's like, you know, you, you get a text from that one person that you don't want to talk to no more. And you're like, are you serious? You see them post a picture with someone that you don't like. And you're like, oh, my day is ruined. You hear a comment you don't like. And we're like, yo, my day is ruined. Isn't it not crazy how it's like one little thing can straight up ruin our day? See, I'm almost 32 years old. I know I look like I'm 30, but I'm actually 31, about to be 32 this July. In my 32 years, you know what I found? It doesn't take much for us to be able to get into like this emotional wreck, right? It can be little things that can ruin our day. But how many people know that we face things every day in life? A lot of us have gone through some of the worst things that we can imagine. And it didn't just mark us and hurt us for a day. It's actually sent us into a funk. And for some of you in here right now, you have been going through some of the most heartbreaking, disturbing things that maybe nobody else knows about, but God sees it today. You need to know that. And I want you to know that today you can take off the mask. You can take off the mask. You don't have to pretend like everything's perfect, but you need to know that if you're going through something, listen to me, maybe, maybe the way you've been handling it and maybe just maybe what you think you need for whatever it is you're facing right now. You know what I'm talking about? Those things that we go through, parents divorce, we go through people just talking so bad about us, spreading rumors, and it makes it to where it's difficult for us to even go to school. It's when those things where we make one mistake that marks us and then it gets spread and ever, now everybody doesn't know me based on who I know I am and who God's called me to be. They judge me based on my mistake in my past. And it's like in a moment, y'all, it's crazy how one thing can send us into a dark, deep depression. And for some people in here, you relate to this so much. And I'm telling you, if you don't feel this in the room right now, you know what that is? That's right now the Holy Spirit speaking to some people. And maybe the way you've been handling what you've been going through, maybe what I've been handling, how, whatever it is I've been going through, isn't what I really need. And tonight, what we're going to look at is what do we really need in hard seasons? And I want you to know our boy Elijah that we read about. He's someone who can help us if we ever are going through a hard season. Right now, you see this dude, Elijah, he was a prophet. Now, somebody say prophet. A prophet was somebody that God appointed to be the mouthpiece. See, they did not have the Bible back in this day. Didn't have the Bible. So you know what God would do? He would appoint and put specific people on earth to be able to communicate. This is what God's saying. This is what he's speaking. And this is what he wants them to do. Now, Elijah, this dude was like a bad man. For real. He was a bad man. But come on. How many people know every time there's like a good person, it's like your classic like like whatever story, superhero story, there's always somebody coming against that person. And in this story, we read about this king named Ahab. That's a dope name. Come on, Ahab. Ahab had a cool name, but he was like a really bad person. He was the king of the nation of Israel, and he was like a really dark person. He needed a lot of help. And honestly, it really wasn't him. It was actually his wicked wife who had the name of Jezebel. Come on, if Jezebel was a person, she would be a cat, you know, because no one likes cat. Je Jezebel had some issues, right? Everyone likes dogs in here, I think. 
Jezebel, yo. In Jezebel. Jezebel controlled the, the relationship. Jezebel controlled everything that King Ahab was doing. And hear me on this. The nation of Israel was in a really dark place. The world was in a really bad place. And what Elijah wanted to do was Elijah the prophet was doing everything in his power to try to change the world around him. And God used him, yo, I'm talking in like miraculous ways. Some things that Elijah did before we read this story in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah prayed for a drought because a lot of stuff was happening to get their attention. He prayed for a drought and for three and a half years, it did not rain in the nation of Israel. That's wild. And in that time, there wasn't a lot of water and not a lot of food. It was scarce. So what God said is, hey, you prayed for that drought. You know what I'm going to do? Supernaturally, I'm going to provide food to you. And it says in the scripture that ravens came and dropped food to Elijah to make sure that he was taken care of, to make sure that God's person was taken care of. That's wild. Elijah, he healed. I'm talking like healed and raised up a little boy who was sick and who died. That's miraculous. I mean, if I saw that, I think that would that'd be the only thing I need, seeing the miraculous. Not only that, there was this showdown that happened right before this verse. I'm talking like, like three verses before. He was on Mount Carmel. The people that we were talking about, Baal, that was like, that would be like the enemy. It was the world's gods. And it was what people went after. If they didn't serve God, people would serve Baal. And they served Baal. And it says that there was this massive massive showdown and they tried to figure out who was the person who had real power was it Baal or was it the God that we're in here to worship tonight and in this moment come on they call down and they 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 do this little show off and come on the power of God shows up through Elijah and then he kills 450 of these prophets come on because that's how the Old Testament is and they were rotten people that killed babies and did all this crazy stuff and so I know it's like God would do that well it's like yo they were doing some messed up stuff and it was different because we didn't have Jesus at that point but all of this miraculous stuff, yo, Elijah would do. It was incredible. Like, it was miraculous. And for me, I would think, yo, if I did all of this stuff, you know. Like, you'd think if you saw some of this miraculous things, right, you would turn to God. You would think that if we saw something like that happen in this room, everybody would be like, yo, God is real. But what happened was whenever Elijah did that in front of all these people, instead of turning to God, they ended up just still casting, throwing stones at him, just rebuking him and saying that God was not real. And it did not change even though all the miraculous things that they saw. And what happened to Elijah was he got so upset because he expected God to do something in a certain timeline, in a certain way. And when it did not happen like he expected, he got super upset at God. And it says this, that after all that miraculous stuff happened, what we read here in this story, it says this, that Ahab went back, he told his wife Jezebel, yo, this showdown happened, all these people got killed, all of our people got killed, what are we supposed to do? And it says this, that Jezebel, his wicked wife, come on, the cat lady, straight up said, hey, go send a message, just a message. She didn't even go, just sent a message and said, hey, go tell him. That if I will die tomorrow if he's not dead by tomorrow. That I'm going to make sure that yet she sends a threat to him. A threat to him. And you know what happens in that moment when Elijah gets threatened? He gets afraid. He gets scared. He gets super discouraged. Why does he get so discouraged? Because what he was waiting for and what he was hoping for didn't turn out the way that he thought. How many people know that sometimes it's unmet expectations it's unmet expectations, things that we hope for, things that we want, that end up getting us into a place that we should never be. See, Elijah, he ended up running. He ended up running from God because of a message, because of a message from the enemy. How many people know that we serve a real, we serve a real God, but just because we serve a real God does not mean that we do not have a real enemy. And there is a real enemy that wants to speak messages to you, to tell you stuff, to lie to you, to tell you you're not worth it, to tell you you'll never do anything great, to tell you that you have no value and they send this message and what are the message meant to do oh not to get us to run from to god but to get us to run from them and when we get discouraged and we get broken you know what ends up happening instead of running to god a lot of times this is the enemy's tactic oh how can i get you to run away from god elijah was running away from god we see in the story an angel shows up tells him to eat all this stuff, and he says, hey, you need journey. You need strength for the journey, but instead of running where he needed to be, he was full of so much discouragement, he ended up even running further. And it says this, that he ran all the way to a cave in Mount Sinai. He ran to a cave. So this man who saw so much power, saw all this stuff in a moment, finds himself in a cave because he is so 
discouraged. I was praying for y'all and I was praying for us. And this is what I felt, that some of you have been in a cave. You've been isolated. You've been alone. You've been broken. You've been lost. And you felt like you're by yourself. And even though, like I said at the beginning, maybe people around you don't know what you're facing. Maybe people around you don't know what you're going through. But I want you to know God sees you tonight. And if you get real with yourself, you get real with what you're going through, I believe God can help you. And I'm just here to tell you tonight, maybe what you think you need and what you really need are two different things. You see, what God does for Elijah to get him out of the cave is what God wants to do for us tonight. Because for some of us, we need to know God's drawing you out of whatever cave you have been in living in, whatever lie you have been living in, whatever place you have been that God has not called you. What sent you there is probably a message from the enemy, lies that you've been believing, thinking that your self-worth isn't good enough, thinking that you can never do anything great with your life, lies that you believe. And when lies that we believe become part of our identity, you know what happens? We end up retreating to caves, being by ourselves, alone and scared. And some of you can relate. So we're going to look real quick what happens in Elijah's life right here. We're going to look just right after this in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9 through 13. This is what happened right after this. There he came to a cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10, and this is what Elijah replied to God when he asked this question. I have zealously, with zeal, I serve the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Verse 11, watch what it says. He tells him, okay, well, go out, stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, and as Elijah stood there, watch, the Lord passed by. The Lord went by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After that wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, went out, stood at the entrance of the cave, and he said this. God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? If you're reading this, you kind of see really quick that Elijah needs to be revived. What does revive mean? I wrote, looked it up. Come back to life to regain strength. Some of you, you know what you need? You need to regain your strength. You need to come back alive. There's some parts of your heart, some parts of your life that have been spiritually dead. And what you need is to be revived just like Elijah. And for some of us, what we think we need, listen, you don't really need what you think you need. See, this is what's so interesting about this. God tells him, hey, I'm about to pass you by. Elijah, he's in this cave, stuck in fear, stuck in discouragement. And God knew exactly what Elijah needed to get him out of this rut. And you need to know God knows exactly what you need to get you out of your rut. Whatever it is, whatever brokenness, whatever mistake, whatever cave you're in, God knows what you need. But so often what we think we need and what God knows we need are two different things. And you see, we learned something so powerful about this scripture. God says, hey, Elijah, I know you're in the cave. And Elijah says, okay, what are you going to do to help me get out? And what he thinks he needs he does not really need it. This is what the scripture tells us. He says, I'm about to pass by. I want you to come out of that cave. I want you to come over here. And it says this, that in that moment, there was a massive windstorm. So massive that the rocks of the mountain started to fall apart. But it says this, that even though God caused it and sent it, he wasn't in it. And then it says there was this massive earthquake, yo. I'm talking like massive. Like he's probably like, what is happening right now? But you know what it says? God wasn't in the earthquake. Then God sends a fire. Oh, that'd be miraculous, a fire. You know what's interesting? The scripture before this, you know how, how Elijah defeated the enemy? Through fire. See, sometimes we're waiting for God and we think that he's gonna show up the exact same way he has in the past or before. But no, we serve a God that does new things and shows up in new ways. And it says that the fire came, but you know what it said? Nah, God wasn't in the fire, was not in the fire. And then it says, that, that he was just like, probably like, yo, all these massive things that just happened. What does that mean for us today? See, for sometimes, you know what we're waiting for? To let God know, to prove to us how real he is, how good he is, how big he is. We're looking for the supernatural, massive things for God to do. 
oh God, I'm in this cave. But if you do something huge, if you do a miracle, then I'll come after you. Oh, if you do this, then I'll know. Do something massive. Give me a million dollars. Heal this, do that. And we look for what God can do. And we think that that's the thing that will get us out of whatever cave we're in. But you know what we learned from this story? It wasn't the massive things that God can do that brought Elijah out of the cave. It says this, that all of a sudden after seeing the, earth, the earthquake, the windstorm and the fire, it says this, so beautiful. It says after that there was a gentle whisper. Oh, a gentle whisper. And he says that God was in the whisper because the whisper it was God's voice. See, for some of you, you know what you think you need to get out of whatever cave you're in? You think you need God to show up to you in a super miraculous way. You know what's interesting about this story? Elijah did all of the miracles that a lot of us would hope to see or want to see that we think would make us truly be able to go full on, 100% all out for God. But even he was the one who did those things and it didn't keep him from not running from God. You see, it's not what God can do that will keep us from running from God. It's understanding who he is. And listen, for some of us, we feel what this is with Elijah. We say, okay, God, give me an experience. Give me an experience and then I'll be able to really follow you. And we think that the experience is everything. I'm here to tell you, experiences are awesome, but it's experiences that are supposed to lead us to a deeper relationship. I wrote this down for you. This can change your life if you catch it. Quit chasing experiences. Watch this. The relationship is the experience. Oh, quit chasing God. Do this massive thing. Show up in this massive way. Come to church. Give me a word. Do this. Do that. No, 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 no. You're missing it. It is not about the experiences. Oh, it's all about relationship. It was the whisper that called him out of the cave. You know what I've learned in my life? If I'm ever in a cave season, whatever gets me out of the cave is what will keep me out of the cave. And if I'm expecting and running to the wrong things, you know what? I'm just going to end up back in the cave. Listen, this faith journey is not some emotional type of thing. We don't put the keys up here just so you can have emotion. We don't scream and shout. We don't want you to just have emotion. We want you to have faith. Emotion will not save anybody, but come on, faith can save every person on earth. For real, he said, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's all about experiences, and I'm telling you, it's not about the experiences. The experience that you're looking for is found in everyday relationship with him. It's simple. That's it. Well, what does that look like? How do I practically do that? You're in a cave. You want to know what you need? You know what the gentle whisper represents? The word of God. Oh. You know, everything you need in your Christian walk is found in this word. This book is alive. For some of you, I, you try to prove it wrong, I dare you. Go through this, try to prove it wrong. If you find something, come talk to me. I can tell you person after person, people that you probably read about in your history books who have ended up trying to prove this wrong, but when they read these words, they end up hearing the gentle whisper, the soft whisper that changes people, that molds them, that shapes them. You can't hear, I can't hear the gentle whisper. No, you can. Because every time you open up this book, you hear the word of God. You hear what he would say. Thank you, Jesus. For time's sake, I, I don't want to go too much. I, I just want to share one more thing about my story, just so you know. I remember this when, uh, you know, I, I had told God multiple times. So if, if you know my story, maybe you don't super quick. Man, I was addicted to drugs, got taken advantage of where I was a kid, caused me to go down a super dark path, always trying to fill the void. I had no father figure in my life. Felt like my dad abandoned me. He would pay child support, but that was it. And it was just, I'd see him sometimes, but because he was distant and lived far away, it just, I didn't have that father figure in my life. Broke me, man. And I was like, I'm like, I used to be ashamed to say that because I felt like it wasn't manly. Uh, but it's like, yo, I, I needed a dad in my life, you know. I needed someone there to teach me stuff, and I, I needed it, you know. And so I would go to different stuff to try to fill that void. And I remember at different points I would hit rock bottom. And people, you, you might know what I'm talking about, and hopefully a lot of you never do. Some of you might, that a lot of times we'd be like, yeah, I hit rock bottom. 
But until we change stuff, what happens is what was once rock bottom, honestly, sometimes becomes a ceiling and it seems like, seems like heaven compared to some of the stuff we're doing. Because what rock bottom happens is you, if you don't change stuff, you keep going further and further and further. You keep getting lower and lower and lower. And I'm telling you, yo, I got to some low places. And you know what I found out my issue was? Whenever I hit that rock bottom, I'd say, God, if you show up in this way, then I'll serve you. Heard about God. My cousins came to a church. I heard about it. I was like, okay, then I'll give you my life. I'll try this thing. And I was looking for the miraculous. I was looking for the fire, the earthquakes, the wind. I was looking for the big things. And you know what I missed out on and I misunderstood? That those things are cool. They're awesome. They show us what God, God can do. But I'm telling you, what really matters is understanding who God is. And the supernatural, oh, it will show us what God can do. And I want you to know we serve a God of power. But I want you to know it is not the supernatural things we see that will keep us on fire for God. It's understanding that we have access to hearing his word, hearing his voice, the gentle whisper. Some of you, what you think you need, it's not what you really need. You don't need God to show up in some miraculous way to show you how good he is and real he is. No, what you need tonight and what you need for the rest of your life is the gentle whisper. What cave have you been running to? You know what's interesting about this text? It said this, the first scripture we read, it said that, this, that Jezebel, she sent a message. She just sent a message, like sending a text message to him. They didn't have text then, but she sent a text message. Yo, I'm gonna kill you is basically what she said. <laughs> like, uh, that's it. It was so loud in his mind. You know what I found? It's the enemy, whenever he speaks stuff to us, oh, it's loud. And for some of you, what the enemy's been speaking over your life has been so loud, so loud. And you're saying, well, why is that so loud? But it seems like God's voice is such a whisper and so quiet. This is what I wrote down. This is what I'm, I was just praying for you that I hope you understand. A whisper from God is more powerful than a shout from the enemy. And whatever God has spoken over you is way, way, way better than whatever the enemy's been speaking over you to get you in that cave. How do I get out of a cave? What do I need? Oh, we need the voice of the living God. Will you stand up with me right now?